Tara, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we're, we're really, really uh, looking forward to this conversation with you um, because you've had some opportunities to, um, to look at what happens with education programs um, before and post journaling the impact of, 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 of these programs, just to give people a little bit of, of background on our, on our, our, our speaker. Um, Tara is with the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy. And starting in 2020, um, they started facilitating nature journaling field trips um, as parts of public programs for all sorts of different ages of people. And they are have been looking at what is the impact of these programs, how do they affect people's connection with nature, um, stewardship, what does this do for the quality of their education program, how does this um, affect their goals of, of being able to develop programs that are inclusive of all sorts of different people and perspectives in, in what they're doing. And um, you've integrated nature journaling in a really meaningful way in your programs. And we hope that um, that we can learn from your experience and uh, that that uh, people in this community may be able to to take parts of these ideas um, and and improve their programs as 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 well. So thank you for being here and also thank you uh, and the con uh, your your program for the the conservation your work you're doing in southern oregon well thank you so much for being here and i feel like i should just note that it is your book your and emily's book that is the foundation of this program and if if we if i hadn't like somehow magically stumbled upon nature journaling i don't know what this program would look like but it wouldn't be what it is today and i am pretty confident in saying that i wouldn't feel um as amazing as I do about the impact that we're having for our students and for our adult learners too. So thank you for making that incredible resource. And then also for like bringing together this community of practice around it um, because it has made it possible for me to build out this program. Well, it, it, to, to be able to kind of get your experience in that and feedback into it, this process of how we do nature journaling, where it's, it's evolving and growing and from, in the field experiences like yours, we're learning more about what works and what doesn't work. And I'm sure that 10 years from now, our understanding of how to lead great nature journaling programs um, is gonna be even richer because of experiences and feedback like yours. Sweet. Well, I'm glad to be part of the ongoing conversation. Welcome. Um, so I've got just a little presentation, couple of pictures kind of set the stage. Um, and so I figured I would pop through that and then we will kind of have some discussion um, with me and Jack and then we'll open the floor. Also, this can be our kind of classic nature journal educators forum group involvement. Um, so I am going to... Okay, before you start on yeah, that, please. Um, while um, Tara's presenting, I want to encourage people to try doing this, just sort of take take notes as... As ideas pop up that kind of stimulate your neurons, rather than listening and going like, oh, yeah, actually write that down. You can do it sketch note style if you want. Um, great place to practice your sketch noting. And um, you're going to find that you are able to kind of, in your brain, hold more pieces of the fabric that Tara's talking about. Um, and also if any questions pop up to you, write those questions down because we're gonna be peppering um, Tara with our, our, our questions to take advantage of, of uh, her experience. And um, so I'm gonna make my screen small and um, the floor is yours. Beautiful, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, let me move all these little boxes out of the way so that I can actually see my own screen, there we go. Um, all right, so nature journaling for land conservation. Um, this is just at the heart of our field trip program um, and it has come to be a really uh, special experience for me as a facilitator. I think it's really special for the kids who are participating and it's also helping to tell the story of the work that we do in a way that feels a lot more accessible. Um, 
Land conservation historically has been in the US has historically been by and for primarily wealthy white landowners, mostly men. Um, and a couple years ago, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy recognized that that is who we have mostly been serving. Um, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy was the first land trust in Oregon. It was established in 1978. And they've been doing good work around land conservation, but primarily using the tool of a conservation easement. So that's a legal easement that's attached to a piece of land where regardless of future um, transfer of ownership of the land, the same rules and regulations um, are focused on conservation will still apply to the land. Um, but in 2017, the Conservancy um, kind of went out on a limb, did a huge fundraising effort and was able to purchase a really spectacular 352 acre property right on the Rogue River here in Southern Oregon. Um, specifically for, I mean, obviously also for conservation because it had very high conservation values, but also so that we would have a property where we could take kids out and be like, hey, let's get to know this place. Let's spend some time here, which when we were working with private landowners wasn't typically an option. Um, so the Conservancy for the last, you know, handful of years has been working toward um, making land conservation a broader conver conversation and a more inclusive movement. Um, and uh, the, the education program was identified as a real avenue for that. Um, because when I work with public schools, I am kind of by definition working with a representative slice of this, the families living in our community. Um, so a little bit of background about our education program. Um, I think of kind of the why of our program as um, helping students build relationships with the land so that they will become our next generation of caretakers. Um, land conservation is a little bit, uh, it's actually quite lofty um, kind of as a field because we talk often about conserving land in perpetuity, like forever. Um, and that's a huge thing to claim, right? <laughs> um, and so if we are only working with our current donors and our current landowners and the people who have historically been part of our community of land conservation, um, that is not necessarily going to be the same group of people that we need to be engaged with our work and excited about our work in five or 50 or, I don't know, 500 years. <laughs> um, and so working with kids and helping them feel really connected to place um, seems like a really integral part of fulfilling our, our both kind of um, organizational purpose of pr protecting land forever, but also our legal responsibility. Like as a nonprofit land trust that holds conservation easements, we are required to have staff who are doing monitoring visits, who are working with the landowners, um, who are ensuring that the terms of each conservation easement are being upheld. And like if our staff ages out and there's no one left to replace them, then we will not be able to fulfill our legal responsibilities in addition to our kind of organizational cultural responsibilities. So helping students build relationship with the land to become our next generation of caretakers. And there are some kind of big foundational pieces to this. Um, I would say the people is a really big one. Our leadership at the Conservancy is all in on this, which is awesome. Um, the board of directors, the executive director, they have just jumped in with both feet with me on this. Um, I'm the first education program manager for SOLC. I was hired onto the team in early 2020, so this is still quite new for us. Um, and they have just been like along for the ride and like ready to say yes to whatever, uh, like especially the unexpected opportunities. I've been really impressed with how they've just been like, we don't know what's happening, especially with COVID those first couple of years, but like, we're going to make something happen. Um, I am the program manager. Uh, at this moment, that feels like a pretty important role in our program. And I am also like, my long term goal is to make my current role obsolete. I want teachers to feel so confident in taking their kids outside. I want them to know where they can go. I want them to feel comfortable with journaling. I want it to be routine. I want it to be regular to the point where like 
the work that I do right now is not like, I hate to think of like working myself out of a job that I love so much, but like, <laughs> um, I would love to kind of hand over the responsibility for the, the facilitation to the teachers. Um, but for right now, I do a lot of the, like, I facilitate a lot of the field trips. I go into classrooms, I get kids ready. I do the coordinating, I do the scheduling. I, you know, so, th so that's a pretty key component to the success of the program is having someone doing all of the logistical um, background stuff in addition to the on the ground facilitation. Um, the school admin that we work with, obviously super key player in any field trip program is getting the administration on board. Um, and that was a little bit of a, a little bit of a journey for sure. And I've found that um, often my avenue into a new school is connecting with a teacher first. Um, and then the teacher can kind of advocate on my behalf and on my program's behalf, um, which kind of makes sense. Admin are being bombarded with so many things all the time that like some random cold call from some lady that they've never heard of offering a field, free field trip is like, why are they going to call me back? <laughs> but if I can make a personal connection with a teacher and kind of help them see the value for their students, then that person will advocate. Often it happens like first they advocate with their grade level team and then um, other folks in the school start getting in touch. Um, so it's this kind of the relationship building thing again um, is really the foundation of the, the connection with the schools. Another uh, major component is the land where we journal. Um, the program was originally uh, conceived of, as I mentioned, for this property called the Rogue River Preserve, which was kind of Southern Oregon Land Conservancy's first foray into ownership, fee ownership. Um, and that was kind of our pilot, and that was our proof of concept. Um, we also, once that went well for a year or so, we also started doing field trip programs on sites that are owned by cities, but we hold a conservation easement, so they're publicly accessible. Um, and now I also go on to school campuses. We do journaling on campus. I think it's really important that kids and teachers know that we don't have to get on a bus and drive somewhere special to have a nature journaling experience. Um, and as I'm kind of like pushing my agenda of um, making my own job obsolete, I'm also starting to look at other public lands. So state and county parks, city parks, um, places within walking distance of schools. A lot of schools have little pocket parks nearby. And so I'm starting to like recommend that more and facilitate field trips on those kinds of sites as well. Whereas at the beginning, the conservancy was more focused on like lands that are officially associated with the organization. Now we're kind of branching out a little bit. Um, and that feels really good to be um, advocating for this, the reality that nature is everywhere. Um, and it's not just a bus ride away and you can never go back. Um, and then of course, funding. That's always a question when you are looking at a program like this. Uh, we do not charge for our field trip program. Um, we had originally thought about making it sliding scale. We've been thinking about making it sliding scale for four years now. <laughs> and it just feels so good to be able to offer it free of charge to schools. We also offer bus funding. Um, we have a line item in the education program uh, budget specifically for schools that need assistance with uh, money for the bus. Um, and that money has to come from somewhere, right? So a lot of our money comes from grants. Um, we have a couple of really, really wonderful foundations here in Oregon that uh, focus on environmental education and place-based learning. So we're like super lucky in that regard. Um, we also get a lot of fundings like from our general operating, from our membership folks do just donating to the organization. Um, and we're lucky that the organization uh, has such strong financials that they can put money into what is a program a program that like runs in the red all the time essentially um, like I don't make I don't expect I'm not expected to bring in any money um, from program fees and then we are also in the very early stages and this is so exciting uh, we are talking about making an education specific endowment um, so that we could have a sustainable, reliable source of funding um, dedicated to the education program. And we have, the Conservancy has um, endowments for specific properties, for the stewardship of specific properties for long term. And so this question arose, like, 
why not have that for our education program too? Uh, so we're super excited to be in kind of the early exploratory phases of that and thinking about what that might look like, knowing that it will be like a probably 10 year plan to um, think that all the way through, court some like seed donors and then get it up and rolling. But super exciting that that's even on the table as a conversation. Um, and then finally, so we've got our people, we've got our place, we've got our dollars. And then there's the like, what do you teach when you're outside? Uh, and as I mentioned before, Jack's book that he wrote with Emily, How to Teach Nature Journaling, is it. That is the foundation of our curriculum. Um, and I love it for a lot of reasons, um, but also because I can just send it to teachers, I can send them to the website and be like, you don't even have to pay for it. You can access this incredible resource for $0 on the internet. Um, and then they can feel like they know exactly what they're getting into with this field trip program. It's not like this secret curriculum that the teachers never see. Um, and then I can also be like, there's a million other really awesome resources from folks who have used this curriculum. We're talking about it every week where, you know, you can go to the website. There's so much good stuff. And so it's this like starting point for such a rich collection of information um, that has made it a really easy like base curriculum to use. So with all of this, uh, all these moving parts uh, in 2023 calendar year, we facilitated about 2,300 student days of programming. Um, student days, what that means is that I, whenever I can, I work with the same kids more than once in a school year. So like if a student had one classroom visit with me and then two field trips, that would be three student days of programming. Um, so 2,300 days, uh, considering that this program started in 2020 and that I had two days in the office, before we all had to work remotely because of COVID. And then for the next two or so years, it was deep COVID. Um, I would say that is a pretty amazing um, and like meteoric rise in engagement with this program. Uh, so that is kind of the big picture of our program. And this program, um, we take kids outside. For many of these kids, uh, this might be their first time going for a hike. Um, we have rain boots and rain ponchos. We have gloves. We provide students with little yoga mats to sit on when they're journaling, right? We want to make this as physically comfortable and accessible as it possibly can be, knowing that not every kid is going to have access to that kind of gear. Um, I included this picture because at this site, I had a group of fourth graders uh, going for a little walk. And at the end of the day, um, I asked them, you know, what was your favorite part of the day? What was the most memorable part? And several kids told me that the most, like, we had had this beautiful day. There was like a million birds. We sat by a waterfall. We journaled. We did all kinds of really cool things. And several kids told me that their favorite part of the day was walking over these rocks, like crossing the creek on the rocks. And I realized that, like, I walk over those rocks all the time and I never even think about it because I've done it so many times. Um, but that was a really valuable reminder for me that um, I had been thinking of the hiking as kind of transition time from one journaling activity to the next, but it reminded me to like let the hiking time also be part of the experience and honor that that might be really special. It might be scary. It might be difficult. It might be surprising or challenging. Um, it might be the coolest part of the day for the kids. So the hiking is now very much part of the experience. But we use nature journaling to kind of give some structure to the day, right? So we'll like walk, we'll have a little welcome circle, we'll walk, we'll journal, we'll walk, we'll journal, we'll walk, we'll journal. And we use a lot of activities lifted straight from the book, How to Teach Nature Journaling. We do the leaf comparison activity to each their own. That's there on the left, early stages of a journal entry about an oak leaf. We do the string safari where we have a rope on the ground and students are looking really closely at just what's going on inside the circle. Um, that's great for students who are new to being outdoors because it can help focus the attention a little bit, um, like reduce the overwhelm of like, what do you mean I'm supposed to decide what to journal about? The world is vast and I am a fifth grader, right? So like, here, we're just going to look inside the circle can be a really effective way to help kids kind of bring it down a little bit, 
minimize that overwhelm. Um, I also absolutely love parking kids in fields of wildflowers. Um, this time of the year especially is just like unreal here on the valley floor in uh, Southern Oregon. So here we've got some students who were uh, given the prompt to create a field guide like page about a flower. Um, and here's an example of some student work from this activity. And I just wanna point out a few things here. So we've got our metadata up top. Um, we've got this beautiful picture that's got all these great details. Um, we've got some labels about the inside, the second and the third flower, um, you know, what order they're blooming in. This student noticed that they have five petals each. He also noted, and this might be my favorite part of this page, that the flower was about five tenths the size of a small rock, um, <laughs> which like on the surface is like, is this a helpful piece of information? But what I absolutely love is that that tells me that this student was working on fractions, right? Like he was learning fractions somewhere else in school. He saw a small rock near his flower and he built this connection between something that he was doing in the classroom, fractions, and making a, a quantitative measurement or statement about this flower, five tenths the size, size of a small rock. Like, amazing. I love it. I don't even care that he didn't use the ruler that he had because five tenths the size of a small rock was a, a way of relating that was working for him in that moment. And then, I also invited the students to name their flowers. Now, if you're familiar with the Rogue Valley, you could look at the date, middle of April, you could look at this drawing, and you could you could know that they, he was on the valley floor, and you would probably be able to make a pretty good guess that this is a Western buttercup, right? Like it's a pretty effective journal entry. However, I, I didn't tell them the name of the flowers. I said, give your flower its own name. And what happened? was for the rest of this day, every time this student saw a Western buttercup, he said, it's my friend Jamal. There's Jamal the gold flower as we were walking down the trail every single time. And he identified it correctly every single time. And he didn't miss any. Like he was so tuned in to Western buttercup, but I'm pretty confident that if I had said, well, that's a Western buttercup, that kid wouldn't have cared. He wouldn't have cared. <laughs> He wouldn't have known it, but because I let him build a relationship with this flower in a way that made sense to him, he was so attuned to this flower. And that was like total win, right? That felt so good. So that's the power of journaling and relationship building. Um, and I see this kind of stuff all the time. This is, this is what it's about. I also, oops, let me back up one. Um, I also absolutely love to do a silent sit. Um, I basically make time for this on every single field trip. Um, it'll typically be our last journal entry of the day um, when the students already have some like fluency and familiarity with our two triads. They've practiced sitting quietly. They've practiced observing closely. They've practiced using words, pictures, number. You know, they have the skill set a little bit in hand. And then at the end of the day, I set them up with like you're gonna sit somewhere at least five really big steps away from any of your friends and we're gonna sit quietly and we're gonna sit quietly for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes and often the classroom teacher is standing behind the kids like don't do it it's not gonna work and i'm like trust me it's gonna work we've got this and sure enough they settle in it almost always takes a few minutes of like squirming and wiggling and moving their mat to a different spot, but they settle in. And then this is where the magic happens. These kids just zone into their journal. They zone into the place and without fail, without fail, when I check in with kids at the end of this activity, typically I'll frame it like, okay, we've been observing the world around us all day, but now I want you to notice what's going on in your own mind and your own body. What happened for you while we were sitting quietly? And these kids say things like, I've never sat that still in my life. I didn't know it was possible for me to feel that calm. Things like, I've never been able to hear myself think before, right? Um, 
And it's like, oh, okay, this, this is what it's about, right? I'm excited to be out here teaching you next generation science standards, science and engineering practices about asking questions and communicating information. That's cool. But learning this skill, learning the self-regulation, self-awareness, ability to settle, capacity for being present, building a relationship with their selves and with a place, that feels very, very important. Um, and that is what journaling has brought to this program. Like I have a 15 year career in outdoor education and I was always super science focused. Science outcomes, we're collecting data, we're doing the data sheet, we're making a model of how energy moves through an ecosystem because you're a sun and I'm a caterpillar or whatever. And like, that's cool. And there's a time and a place for that. But the journaling has allowed me to tap into the social emotional skills in a way that I didn't know was possible. Um, and, and that I think more than the science skills is what's setting these students up to be the next generation of caretakers. They love this place. They love the feeling in their bodies and their minds when they are sitting on the land. They feel connected. And whether they, like, I don't really care if they grow up to be like land stewards as a job or like botanists, but if they are um, teachers, if they sit on their city council, if they vote, right? Like these are like, we need people thinking critically about land and people's relationship to land in every aspect of our communities in order for land conservation um, to be successful long-term. So that's what we're doing here with these kids in this magical forest and also on their school campus, right? Practicing this same kind of awareness and presence, not just on, not just in the fancy woods, but closer to home too. So that's the kind of like really feel good um, moving toward conservation work that we do with journaling. I do also just want to throw out there too that we also have a little bit more of the hard skills thing going. And um, so for an example of that, uh, something that I'll do if I'm looking at something like invasive species removal um, is we will journal about our target species first and then I turn the kids loose on finding and pulling out whatever the target species is. So for example, here's some curly dock. I pulled a couple curly docks out um, and handed them around the group. They took 10 or 15 to record. You know, again, we had practiced journaling several times already this day. They kind of knew what to expect. But you can see here, we've got a couple sample pages where they were looking really closely at the curly dock. They were making great observations about the shape of the leaves. Um, some students were drawing kind of like curly dock grows in little uh, seasonal pools. And so some students were drawing like just the little tips of the leaves coming above the water, you know, whatever was most helpful for them in those 10 or 15 to like tune in with this. And then once they've done that, I feel really confident just being like, okay, go forth and find the plant. And I don't have to worry about them pulling out things that are not the plant um, because they've just spent this time building a relationship with the target species. This is also really effective to do when there's a lookalike species. We'll do a little side-by-side -side comparison right in the journal. Um, and it's the students identifying how to tell them apart and writing it down in their journal or drawing it in their journal so that then they have that sense of ownership when they go to look at the plants like oh yeah i already know this because i put it in my journal not like what did that lady say about the shape of the leaves right like i wouldn't blame them for not listening either right <laughs> so they have this ownership and it's it's always successful like and i can put them out on places where we have federally listed endangered plants and when we've spent that time building relationship with the plant, I can feel really confident that they're not gonna go like pulling up the endangered flower because they have spent a little bit of time observing closely. And I'll say this is also really effective with adults. I do the same strategy with adults. Um, 
And uh, like we did a workshop last year about Dyer's Woad. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Dyer's Woad. It's a super aggressive plant in um, Northern California. It's really bad. Um, and it's it looks a lot like mustards. Um, and so we did this side-by-side -side comparison. And then we turned our folks loose to collect just the Dyer's Woad. And then we actually used the Dyer's Woad to dye fiber blue. <laughs> so it was this like fiber arts plus uh, conservation workshop, which was really fun. Um, I've also done stuff like this with, um, we have a master naturalist course here in Oregon that's run through the um, OSU Extension Agency. And like I had, I think I was given like 10 minutes with the, with the group of master naturalists students one year. Um, and so I did a, like a quick and dirty observational drawing because a lot of what they do is botany and they're like learning the ins and outs of like these super involved botanical things. And even just 10 minutes of like, let's talk about noticing shapes. Let's talk about noticing like the overall scale. Let's talk about using labels on your drawing because you don't have to convey everything with just your pencil, like with just the, the shapes that you make, you're also allowed to like write things and put numbers. I had several people in that program come up to me and be like, this was the most useful 10 moments of the program. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, this is what we needed. And again, it's because it invites close attention without making the expectation of like learning the, the like memorizable pieces as the primary thing. It's like building a relationship with the plant, building a relationship with the place. Um, I also often talk about nature journaling, like at our fundraising events or for community partners. And I almost always get the question, like, so when are you going to start offering grown up field trips? <laughs> like, why do only the kids get to go on your field trips? And I'm very excited that we are actually going to be launching a Southern Oregon Land Conservancy nature journaling club um, starting. Pro our first field trip will probably be next month. So I'm really excited to be rolling this out to our kind of general public also outside of our field trip program and these kind of specialized programs that we've offered as workshops for the Conservancy. So that is what I've got for you, a little bit about how nature journaling is fitting in to Southern Oregon Land Conservancy's conservation efforts right now. That is really, really, really exciting. You have gone all in. This is this is this this is an amazing project and i i i'm 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 just delighted with what you've got going on here can, can i I've, I've got a bunch of questions for you yeah please all right um so um so first of all just sort of some some uh logistics act um uh, parts of this um you've got tons of rain Right. And a lot of people say, like, well, we're going to be we can't nature journal in the rain. How do you wrangle rain? Yeah. So I will be honest, Southern Oregon, I live like right over the border from California. So basically, I have oh. Northern California weather. Okay. Um, the rain is real, though. And um, sometimes if it's really coming down, I just skip the paper journal altogether. And we do a yeah. lot of I notice I wonder it reminds me of out loud as a group or in pairs, um, because nobody has a good time when your journal is literally falling apart. Yeah, And it's like, yeah, the kids are like, you can't draw on a soggy paper. No, which is like, fine. So sometimes we do that. Um, you might have seen in that picture of the silent sit with like the the cool vines of the trees, a bunch of the kids so turned. Of their, yeah, so a bunch of the kids took their ponchos and like, tucked themselves inside their poncho oh. and there was enough light in there that they were like they made themselves a little tent yeah. and they were very happy and very content and had lots of really wonderful things to say about what it was like to be in their little poncho tent in the rain um, i've had mixed success with the like oversized ziploc bag method um which is like using one of the humongous ziploc bags and putting your journal in the ziploc bag and then like writing or working in your journal in the bag. 
more effective with adults than with kids. It's a lot for kids to manage. Um, I'll also like, if it's a day that's kind of drizzling on and off, I'll just kind of keep an eyeball up. And if it stops raining for a while, we'll sit and journal. Yeah. And once it starts raining, we kind of pack it up and do our debrief and move on and hike a little bit. Um, so it, it becomes a, like the flexibility of journaling is really important for that kind of a day where, um, you know, if I was like really attached to a set curriculum, taking a particular amount of time, like I'd be hosed. <laughs> um, but because there's this flexibility with journaling to, you know, if we're feeling it, like if the kids are feeling it, we can keep going. Or if the weather is good, we can keep going. If any of those things isn't true, we can pack it up and move on. There you go. Yes. And, and you're also, you're doing the, the, the approach of, of walk, journal, walk, journal, walk, journal. Mm -hmm. I, I find that that is huge. If you just kind of like, I'm glad you're off the bus. Here's your journal. Let's sit down and just do journaling. Uh, people, we got to walk. We've got to move. I mean, kids aren't sitting animals, are they? No, they're not. And so, like, I will also often get kids ask if they can journal while they stand. And that's fine. Yep. I'm like, as long as you don't run away. <laughs> as long as you're not distracting your classmates, if you would rather stand, that's fine. It definitely, uh, it, it has been a lot of learning for me personally as an educator to like loosen up on the reins a little bit and let it be more free form and mm -hmm. let kids show up how they are and like recognize and honor their individual needs in the moment. And journaling is, it allows for that in a way that a lot of the programs I've worked in the past, like there wouldn't have been space for a kid to be like standing over by himself on the other side of the trail. And I could, you know, I wouldn't know that they were still able to participate. Um, the journaling gives just so many more opportunities for kids to engage in a meaningful way um, that doesn't look normal. Right. <laughs> Now, we uh, in our book club we read the uh, book the power of making thinking visible and one of the strategies that was made kind of apparent in that in that was they were saying like stop over planning things yeah like we we get every little moment all planned out I'm going to do this and this and this and this and get your general ideas then you need to be out there in the field and we're going to flex this depending on you're watching the kids their energy level you're yep. watching the weather what's it going to yep. do and then yep. you're figuring out these places and then you're getting some exercise sitting down and focusing. But if we overstructure, we overplan everything, it's it's not going to work out. Yeah. And I would say that like the magic of all outdoor education is in taking advantage of the teachable moments, right? And like knowing how to do that as an educator and feeling like you have enough, um, like enough activities or facilitation strategies in the pocket to like know which one to pull out at whatever moment. Um, and being, you know, like there was a day a couple of weeks ago where I had a group of kids out and I, I will say, I typically work with a full class at a time. Um, so I will have up to 30 students yep. with me, which is like kind of a lot, but I had a group of probably 25 kids. I had a plan, you know, I thought we were going to start with a sound map and then we were going to do the, you know, look in the pond or what, like I had this plan. And as we were hiking, we saw a herd of Roosevelt elk going by. It was like, we're not doing a sound map. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, of course, we're not doing a sound map Everybody right now. Everybody <laughs> close your eyes and start listening. <laughs> right? Yeah, like, no, of course, we're going to look there and we're going to practice the like, what do you notice? What color are they? How are they moving? How many are there? Are, are they going fast or slow? Which way? You know, and it was like that capacity to like totally divert in a moment and still have it be functioning in the context of like, I promised the teachers a nature journaling field trip. Yep. I'm still delivering a nature journaling field trip, even though it's not the one that I thought was going to happen. Right. right. And because you can, because I can be flexible because the, the nature journaling allows for that flexibility, it makes a much richer experience than the, like, I have 20 minutes at this station. I have to look at seven different kinds of bugs in the water, and then I'm going to send you to your next station. Right. You lose a lot of the kind of space for the wonder of like what is emergent today. And and also with with that 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 sort of very structured approach, um, 
you are telling them this is what you do when you are in in th this is what you do now this is what you do now this is what you do now right with the nature journaling you're giving them a skill that they can apply on their own any place that they go you, yes. you, you said that eventually you kind of get to the point where they're okay i understand the two triads and and i understand right. how this works together and um you're teaching them to be self-sufficient explorers Right. rather than teacher dependent drones yes that's the hope anyway <laughs> that's that's that, 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 that that's a good thing to aspire to yeah. <laughs> um do do you um have any uh personal favorite kind of go to when in doubt i love this activity um i know a lot of things yeah. are situation dependent um but do you have any personal faves I mean, like, this is kind of like asking if you have a favorite child. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like every okay. single no, one no, is no, amazing no, in its own way. So Silent Fit, I already mentioned, yeah. that's yeah. like my, my heart, like my heart activity go to, not just because I also get to sit and meditate for 20 minutes in the middle of my workday. Um, but because of what it brings up in the students, but in terms of one that's a little bit more structured, the, um, the leaf comparison to each their own. I absolutely love. Um, it makes for a really solid introduction to the words, pictures, numbers thing. Um, because it's like immediately apparent when they're trying to match each other's leaves to their pages. Like if you just did an outline and nothing else, like we're going to have a hard time. Or if you just wrote the words brown leaf, like no one's going to yep. figure it out. So there's this immediacy to the feedback without feeling like uh, the pressure of official feedback. Um, it's this kind of gentle peer-to-peer -peer, um, realization of the value of like really rich information mm -hmm. on the page. Um, I often get really cool debriefs out of that one because of that, because they're getting to see each other's pages um, as part of the activity. And they know going into it that we're going to be looking at each other's pages um, which I think is really nice for them. So it's not like a surprise, you know, cause I set it up, like, this is what we're going to be doing. And once we've spent time journaling, we're going to, you know, put everyone's journals in the middle. So they already kind of know it's like just heightened a touch, like the expectation of, of presentability is heightened just a little bit. And yeah. so that encourages often like, a, I never want to like require a tidy page. And I'll often say like, it's okay for your page to, make, to be messy. But in this one, it's nice for them to be thinking a little bit about how stuff is laid out on the page. And it's also one that you can do over and over and over again, because they have like students often remember that activity and they're like, nobody could figure out which leaf, you know, nobody could make the match between my leaf and my page the first time I tried it. But then a couple months later, after I've done journaling for a little bit longer and I have a, you know, more fluency with this skill, it's an, it, you know, like this time they were able to make the match right away. And it's really cool for that growth mindset. I know that's something that we talk a lot about yeah. in this group, but that like using that activity because it also invites the peer, like visibility with peers, I think kind of heightens that sense of growth mindset. Yeah. So that's one that I- That's a really good thought. Absolutely love. And I'll also say that for programs where there is a little bit of, um, like push to do tree identification or like plant identification. It's a really easy sell to like do that activity. And then when you're done, be like, oh, by the way, this is a white oak leaf. So let's just write white oak leaf at the top. And yeah. now it's like, okay, we've just spent a half an hour looking very closely at all of the amazing variations that a white oak leaf might have. Maybe next time we do it with a black oak leaf. And now we have a white oak ID page and a black oak ID page. Uh, um, yes. And then an alder ID page and a cotton, you know, so that it's this like low touch um, learning our Western names for things skill without having it feel like rote memorization. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, you, you, you mentioned in that the debrief. Yeah. And I was wondering, what is your experience about the value importance of that debrief and discussion after a journaling activity? And um, how do you use that or not use that in the programs that you are doing? Actually, maybe we should first explain what this is for folks. Maybe, 
that might be a good place to start because there might be some people who are unfamiliar with the book and the suggestions of doing that. Yeah. So the debrief is like after we've spent some time. So there will be the like setup for the activity, explaining here's what we're doing, maybe doing a little demonstration on the whiteboard. Then there's the time for the students to do the activity themselves. And then there's this follow up component, the debrief, where we kind of uh, we either share the things that we noticed and recorded on the page and or we share what we noticed about the activity itself. So it's like either direct uh, kind of debrief or like meta debrief. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an opportunity for the students to do a little bit more processing um, either in pairs or as a whole group and to do a little bit more. Um, I find it to be really useful to think about like my theme for the day, making sure that there's like a through line. The de a lot of that comes out in the debrief. Yep. And for me, debrief is non-negotiable. Like if I have to cut a couple minutes of journaling time to ensure that I have a couple minutes of debrief time, I will do that every time. Like that there, I, I don't want to say there's no point in journaling and then like closing the journal and getting on the bus, but there's like almost no point in like <laughs> journaling and closing the journal and getting on the bus. It's such um, an opportunity. Everybody's been intensely looking at something. Yeah. Thinking about this thing. And if you're like, that was great. Look over Bye. here. Right. It, you lose so much of that experience. Um, and, and the debrief can be super simple. Like, I know that we talk a lot about using the, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of when we're giving feedback to students, but I also do the same thing when we're debriefing as a group. What did you notice about this activity? What did you notice that you want to share with the group? And sometimes they're like, I noticed that the leaf was fuzzy, which is super cool. And sometimes they're like, I noticed that at first I didn't notice any details, but then when I, you told me to look for more stuff and I got kind of bored and then I kept looking, then I actually found so many things because I didn't have anything else to do but look at the leaf and it's so amazing. And here's 18,000 things about the leaf. And it's like, okay, <laughs> yes. Like, and, this and, is yeah. why I'm asking the question. And then I'm like, who else had the same experience? And like every kid in the class is like, yeah, me too, right? And so it allows for some community building around this shared experience, especially when I'm asking them to do things that are kind of weird or uncomfortable, things that they've never done before. Um, it gives a little bit of processing time and like validates that it was a little weird and uncomfortable maybe, um, and also helps identify and articulate the value of the experience. Yeah, and you, in your program, you're also doing a lot of things trying to get a program that's going to be inclusive to a bunch of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And in something like this, where everybody has been looking at the leaf, we all are coming from the same sort of base of experiences. There's no, it's like, you know, anybody who's seen an eclipse, you know, uh, right. you know tell us about this. But, there's, but the, this is then an experience that is shared by all students. And you can then um, do you find that then people's willingness to participate in those discussions goes up? And do you think the, and I'm also wondering about particularly people who are not usually perhaps contributing to a science discussion in a, in a class? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think too that um, to, to kind of have a gentle on-ramp to these discussions, absolutely the shared experience is really important. And I will often do the think, pair, share routine yes. where I'll pose a question or a prompt. I'll give students, you know, 60 seconds or whatever to think about it quietly. I'll have them then turn to someone near them and share what they were thinking about and then invite anyone who wants to share with the whole group to do so. And that kind of stair steps them up <laughs> instead of just being like, okay, entire class, raise your hand if you blah, 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 blah then the kids who need a little bit more processing time, the kids who are feeling a little uncertain, they're never going to raise their hand. I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> like, let's be real. But by giving some quiet processing time and some like practice conversation time with a, with someone who's presumably a friend because they're standing next to each other on their field trip, um, it really brings down that barrier for participation. And I found too, that often I will, um, one of my favorite things to do is that exact process with like, what's one question that you had while you were journaling? And um, and the first time I might just have like a couple kids offering a, a question for the whole group, but the more we practice the questions and the more we're like sharing out with the whole group, the more kids are willing to participate. 
And usually by the end of the day, I can do like a rapid fire all the way around the circle. Everybody shares a question and I don't have anyone saying, I don't want to share a question, but being mindful that there's this kind of like scaffolding into that, I think is really valuable instead of just expecting kids to be ready from the jump to share out loud in front of a whole group. Um, But yeah, that, that shared experience then becomes super important because if you have kids who have who feel like who have never gone hiking or while some other kid is like, when I was in Switzerland last summer with my family, the Alps, right. And you're like, Oh, okay. We have a disparity here. Um, And then the kid who's never gone hiking is like, I don't have anything to share here. Right. Um, So using that shared experience is invaluable as a starting point for that really rich discussion that feels inclusive of everyone. That uh I, I i so wish that strategies like this were on my radar when i was starting to teach my <laughs> model was kind of the classroom thing of you the teacher asks a question and you ask people to raise their hands and then first hands a hand up gets called on right the stuff was not on our radar no or at least it wasn't on mine it all. wasn't on mine either <laughs> and 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 the things like the the think pair share and you're, you're talking about like the, the scaffolding, giving kind of a social uh, safe place to think mm-hmm. about these things and interact with them. And then you interact in that group, then interacting with this larger group feels more natural. It's less right. threatening. And the conversations are so much better. Yes. Yeah. Because you have so many more voices involved. Yeah. That's right. Um, what... As, as you are kind of going around and sort of scanning for and scanning the environment, like it's easy when, when, when the elk show up, right? right. Like, <laughs> you know, phenomena has arrived, right? right? Charismatic um, megafauna yeah, is on the mega, scene. <laughs> mega phenomena uh, <laughs> have, have arrived. And, um, but, but what, as, as you are kind of going around the landscape, sort of trying to figure out like what you're going to do where, what kind of, cues are you looking for or what kind of um what, what sort of thinking about like timing in terms of you know kid tiredness kid energy level how are you kind of managing that and when are you deciding kind of looking at the same sorts of things in your kids as as you're looking at, at the phenomena of the kids behavior right. <laughs> then deciding it's time to wrap this have a discussion and then get moving again what what are some things that you at from your personal experience doing this that you're you're learning about how to how to wrangle that kind of timing and flow in the field? I know that's a it's a big umbrella, but yeah. What 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 kind of strikes you in that? Yeah, I mean, I think that a big part of it is um, being aware that like how my body and mind is doing is not necessarily the same as how the kids' bodies and minds are doing, <laughs> like. I run ultra marathons for fun. I can be on my feet for a long time. And a kid who's never gone for a hike before is going to be tuckered after 10 minutes on their feet, right? And so separating my personal lived experience and my capacity for suffering (laughs) from what I'm expecting of my kids is super important. Um, And so that also, like, I hate being cold. I have been in an outdoor field for my entire career. You better believe I have an entire closet of like merino wool and waterproof things and the perfect boots for every occasion. And so especially if it's inclement weather, thinking really hard about like, okay, I am perfectly physically comfortable right now, but my kid over here who's in a cotton sweatshirt is probably having a bad time. And I actually know a couple of facilitators who will only dress in like the clothing that they expect their students to have so that they can be more tuned in to that. And I feel like I, that is a real commitment Yeah. <laughs> and I hate being cold. So I don't know that I would be at my best <laughs> if I did that, but it means that I have to be really careful, right. About like, I'm kind of hungry, but I'm also a grown up, and I can regulate that I'm hungry and I can also work at the same time. Um, I have found almost every single field trip, Um, The kids will get off the bus telling me that they're hungry. Um, And then it's still like an hour until snack time and three hours until lunchtime. We usually do snack and lunch like as much as an hour or an hour and a half early compared to when they're at school. 
-hmm. just let that happen. Like if the kids are starting to like drift a little bit with their focus or often they'll just tell me out loud, like, I'm really hungry. I'll be like, what time do you eat lunch? 1230. Well, it's 11 o'clock now. And so we'll walk for 10 more minutes and then we'll eat or whatever. Like I don't, I don't stay attached to the school schedule for food. Um, and that, like, I used to try to be like, well, you don't eat until 1230 at school. So we're going to eat at 1230. That's right. But we're, like their we're, bodies we're, and their brains to this time rather like, than this then time. like the body time. Right. Yeah. And like, the, I'm asking so much of them. They're, you know, moving their bodies, probably many of them more than they usually do. Their brains are probably totally overloaded. They're, you know, we've got these like stacking things, all of which take energy, like calories to happen in the body. So if we eat lunch at 11, we eat lunch at 11 and that's fine. And I never get kids getting back on the bus at 1.30 being like, I'm hungry because I ate lunch two hours ago. You know, <laughs> like it never happens at that point in the day. So I don't worry too hard about, about that. Um, I will say that I, something that I do kind of always have in the back of my mind um, is where my next um, like physically good stopping point is going to be because uh, I work on sets. Yeah. So like the Rogue River Preserve, I love it because it's a lot of flat open spaces. There's plenty of meadows that I can pull off into that don't have a field of poison oak involved. Um, it, like probably I wouldn't need to walk more than five minutes in any direction along the trail at that particular preserve to get to a place where I could pull the kids off the trail and park them comfortably. Um, the calculus is a little different when it's really hot because I'm always looking for shade and like managing the shade and poison oak, like Venn diagram is a little yeah. bit more challenging. Um, but that's something that I'm always thinking about. But at other sites, um, like we have one site that's down in this little, you know, this beautiful wooded little ravine, but it's all steep. It's almost entirely single track. And so what I think of as my educational eddies, the places where I can like pull off the trail and make our little eddy, um, to circle up, those are few and far between. And so I know that like, okay, this trail intersection has enough space to circle up. Um, but from here, it's going to be probably 10 minutes of walking before I, I'm at my next good spot. Yeah. And so I have to kind of gauge more carefully at sites like that where, um, like, okay, maybe I was planning on making it all the way to the waterfall, but this group is really tuckered. So we're actually going to sit at this place instead, um, because I don't think they're going to make it another 10 minutes and be ready to then like arrive able to journal. Um, so it, it definitely changes based on the terrain. Yeah. I, and that, I love also what you're saying there about using those those snacks strategically because um, th those can also be things that like bring together like you pull out a bag of of trail mix and the group has concentrated right? yeah. Um, yeah. and the um so i i'm also in the same boat where i'll, I'll often like i'll pass out some snacks to students and then while we're eating our snacks we're having a discussion yeah. and people are you know, nom, nom, nomming yep. the trail mix. Yeah. Um, and it is, it also, I think, sends this sort of interesting mes message of, I'm looking out for you. Right. Yeah. Um, which helps build relationships. And right. that's what we're all about. Yeah. Well, yeah. And if the kids are saying like, I'm so hungry and I'm like, suck it up. We're going to keep hiking. So what are they hearing from me? Not that time. What right. Time? My they're watch hearing, do not understand. Right. They're hearing that I don't care that they're hungry. Yes, that's right. And sometimes I'll, like if I have some kids who are like, I'm so hungry and other kids who are like, we don't eat for another hour. I'm fine. I'll like take it to a vote. You know, close your eyes. Everybody who wants to eat right now, raise your hand. Everybody who wants to eat in another 20 minutes, raise your hand. And then it's like, you know, they can have a say in it. 
I'll also have them close their eyes so that if there's a direction that I feel that it needs to go, I can just throw the vote. There you, there you go. <laughs> and it, it, you don't have to um, go by majority. No. Go by like, there's enough people who are hungry that maybe right. some snacks are in order. Right. Or like the desperation hand raise. <laughs> like, okay, one desperation hand raise means- Yeah, that... <laughs> we got to get some snacks on that kid. Right. Yeah, we got to get some calories on board. Otherwise, we're going to start having a bad time. <laughs> yeah. So- what I'm, I'm just sort of to, sort of zooming out from this, I'm seeing that you're building relation, you're helping kids build relationships with the land by paying attention. You are mm -hmm. helping yourself build relationships with them by doing exactly the same thing, by paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you pay attention to the landscape so you know where there is a clearing up ahead. Mm -hmm. um, you're paying attention to their their energy level, how spaced out the group is getting as we start to 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 to, to hike if people are starting to kind of be pushy shovey yeah. right then like mm, snacks help with kids being pushy shovey yeah because yeah. you're not yourself when you're angry no i'm certainly not i'm that's, that's <laughs> right this is this is really really inspiring i would love to kind of get some uh questions from our larger community here yeah um, please and so if people have questions, you can use the raise hand function on Zoom. So hit that button and then you will boop, 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 boop automatically in the queue. If you can't find that button, just turn on your screen and, and do like a little dance or kind of do this. Um, and then we will spot you. Um, and, uh, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about this, what that gets you thinking about. Or if there's something that Tara said that you're like, I want to just like when you mentioned this, that really resonated with me. We want to do those for several reasons. Um, one is you having that conversation with Tara will help that idea stick in your head better, right? Because of the reinforcement of that, you're more likely then to remember that and incorporate it into your own educational programs. And also there'll be somebody else in this group like, like, oh yeah, that was a real thing. And I didn't even get that in my sketch notes. Huh. All right, I'm going to like put that in right now. So um, any thoughts, questions, comments, or ideas, um, we would love to get those out on the table now. So please feel free to join in our conversation. Or you may need a snack. By the way, folks, when you come to these workshops, it's okay to have snacks with you. We encourage snacks. <laughs> um, let's join um, Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, Point Blue is um, an amazing uh, uh, science um, and public education um, uh, program that gets um, takes data to help us be able to make conservation decisions. And also um, it does a lot of public education about these sorts of things. Um, Anne Chadwick, welcome to the conversation. And what um, uh, what does this get you thinking about or what are you wondering about? Um, lots of things. My first question is, Tara, can we clone you please? <laughs> and just put you all over the place because what you're doing is fantastic. And oh, thank you. Um, really appreciated your presentation and your thoughts. Yeah. Thank and, you. And just, just on that line, um, if an organization wanted you to come out to their, their, their site to do a training with them, would you be willing to travel? Yes. All right. Yeah. I actually, so I also contract, I like moonlight in instructional design and teacher training. Um, like contracting. So if it's like a little further afield than I can reasonably swing as a representative of Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, then I can, my schedule is flexible enough that I can usually take a day or two off. And I would be so excited to go on some little adventures with you all. Good to know. I'm glad I asked. Okay. Um, and another question, this is something that you touched on was dealing with adults and so I'm chair of the board of Point Blue. And so I'm always trying to engage our board members and our supporters. And just wondering, you, you talked a little bit about having adults join you. And we have a straw program, Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed, where the, we occasionally bring out board members or supporters to get their hands dirty with the kids, um, restoring a riparian habitat. 
Um, so advice about that and about like doing it with the the kiddos and the adults together or do a separate group that would be just the board members or just the supporters. Um, what's your experience there? Yeah, great question. And I would say there's definitely space for both. Um, if like whenever I have kids and adults in the same place at the same time, I like to make sure that I have had some time just with the adults first um, so that we can have some kind of shared expectations about what's going to happen, some shared vocabulary about how we, when we're looking over a kid's journal page, what do you say to them, <laughs> for example, right? Um, and it's not to say that it's this like super involved in-depth training, um, but I think there's a great deal of value in spending a little bit of time with your adults um, ahead of time so that you can be kind of a united front and um, all pulling in the same direction. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I think there's something really magical about the intergenerational on the land thing. And um, working with just adults can be its own really kind of fun because you can like go way down the rabbit hole a lot faster, mm -hmm. right? The like self-awareness, the self-management is generally pretty well dialed in adults. Um, and so the, the capacity for the like meta discussion, I've found rolls a little bit faster. Mm. Flip side is that kids tend to be a bit of an easier sell on like, it's okay if your art isn't beautiful. It's okay if your page is messy. Right. And so there's like also a benefit of working just with kids is that you're not like swimming upstream against like decades of cultural conditioning about what it means to be an artist or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say that biggest recommendation would be if you're going to have adults and kids at the same time, have even just a little bit of time with the adults yeah. specific That's to that program ahead of time. Really important. Okay. Yeah. And my last thing is um, everybody be careful when you're doing stewardship. No, I no. broke my arm when I was out at the beach two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago um, for a cleanup out at Bodega Bay that was in snowy plover habitat. And there's this fishing vessel that had come aground and it had broken up and there was all this debris around. So I, I found this perfect piece of debris up in the driftwood that I thought I have to get to it. And I tripped over the driftwood and put out, you know, the brace your hand. And I yeah. should have rolled, Jack, right? Should have rolled. Yeah. But anyway, it's a little fracture. So, okay. you know, stewardship. Real commitment to conservation over here. I know. That's, that's right. uh, so. <laughs> Uh, and Chadwick is taken one for the team. Yeah. Right. Uh, you get a purple heart or a, a green heart, a green heart um, for um, for a uh, an, an entry in the line of stewardship. There you go. So keep doing stewardship, but be careful out there. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. And, and so, so, and I, I also wanted to sort of, you know, tag in on this idea of these these intergenerational um, programs. Um, I think that that you know people we're, we're used to kind of education programs segregated by age, um, because it, it helps us kind of put people through the processor. Um, but it is delightful when we actually get intergenerational programs. We've done that a lot with Nature Journal Club things. Um, Grownups seem to be a little bit more vulnerable when they're around kids. And kids, when they're seeing all the grownups being all in on it, they're like, I guess this is normalized now. I guess we're all in. It's a beautiful thing that happens when we do that, right? Mm -hmm. Um so thank you on behalf of all of us for what you're doing with with Point Blue. So sorry about your injury, and I wish you a speedy recovery. Um, so if there's anybody in this group who is uh, watching this, who um, I, th I think if anybody does like you know clay or craft work, we need to make a green heart for uh, to get to to Ann Chadwick. If anybody can um, uh, has has kind of come up with a kind of a fun way of doing that. Um, Let's let's see if we can make that happen. Uh, if you make it, we can get it to Anne. Please let us know. Um, and thank you. Thanks. By the way, what is the uh, phenomena tally so far? Oh, 
eight, I think, unless yeah. I've missed any. But, All right. <laughs> yeah. Was that including mega phenomena? Uh, I think that one might, should maybe get two. So maybe we're okay. up again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's got, it's got, we got to, we got to make that a thing. Mega phenomena. Because it is mega. I yeah. like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, let's bring in Star. Um, Star, thank you so much for for being with us here. Um, you can now unmute and welcome to the conversation. Well, actually, yeah, there we go. Okay, I think I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Congratulations, Tara. It's very wonderful work you're doing, and it's inspiring for all of us. You know, whatever we do with nature journaling, to be listening to just the incredible work that you've been able to accomplish and, you know, bring to those lucky, lucky kids. Well, so I, I, I had, I had several things come up in my mind as you were talking. First of all, I'm a, I'm a meditation person. So <laughs> I wanted to ask if you did walking meditation with the kids at all. You know, I, I used to in programs that had less, space for meditation because that was like the only time that I got to do it okay and I haven't been doing it in the context of these nature journaling field trips but that is a fabulous suggestion to yeah, kind of it's... set the stage mm -hmm. for the silent sit or other quiet yeah. activities and, and if you have somebody who finds it really hard to sit it could be an option for that mm -hmm. young person and mm -hmm. the connection of the foot to the earth is so powerful if you have mm -hmm. them outside I think it would be super mm -hmm. and um, I wondered if you knew about pebble meditation no tell me more tell me about pebble meditation oh, I'm gonna well, yeah, I'm writing this down <laughs> <laughs> there's a standard there's a standard one I think it's on the Plum Village website but um it it brings so I'll let me I'll try not to take too much time with this but um they're usually four pe pebbles and they put them in one hand yeah I mean or you could take them and give them ki kids you know four sweet little stones and so they take their first pebble and the classic rendition of this is the first one is they think of a flower and the flower brings them freshness and they're invited to dwell in freshness and then the stone goes to their other hand and the second one let me see flower fresh oh the, is a mountain so they think of a mountain and they think of stability so you're cultivating these qualities in the youngster and it could be an adult really so then you take the second pebble after they're feeling stable and they put that in the other hand. Then the third is calm, calmness. And you invite them to envision a lake or a still pond and to think, identify with the calmness of the water. And then you take that pebble and put it over in your other hand. And then the last one is space. And you ask them to think about space and then you invite them to feel free and you take that fourth pebble and put it in their hand. So it's just a way of introducing these qualities that you want to have within. Um, but it would be a really nice introduction into a quiet sitting time. Um, and the other thing I thought of, I just thought of this, so I haven't thought it through, but when you were talking, I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun to have the kids identify four things? that they can see mm -hmm. right there in their environment and attach. I mean, you could just make it up as you go, you know, attach some quality to each of the things, some positive quality <laughs> and have them move the stone, you know, but I think it's a neat thing to do with young people and you might enjoy it. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. I love that. And I am going to reflect on how I can bring that into the journaling. Um, this is reminding me of, uh, I had a group out at a preserve called, um, Whetstone Savannah. That's part of our agate desert landform. So it's like covered in really cool agates, oh, um, yeah. which are these like really rad kind of semi-translucent rocks. And so like, I hadn't even said anything 
but almost every student had like already picked up a rock by the time we got to our first stopping place. And I was planning on doing one activity, but we did a U-turn and we did the, to each their own activity, but with a rock instead of with a leaf, which was like hilariously more complicated and difficult because a <laughs> leaf is like functionally two-dimensional, right? Like to a fifth grade mind, you trace it and then you draw the features and maybe you do that on the other side, but a rock is like inherently three-dimensional. And so it invited this really interesting question of like, okay, well, I, I can trace it, but you know, <laughs> but then if I turn it on the side or if my pencil is slanting in um, and then like measurement became really important because some of the rocks were this big and some of the rocks were this big, um, but the kids got really attached to their rocks um, yeah. like very quickly. And I am, you know, usually I'm a, like, everything here is someone's food or someone's home. We have to leave it behind. Um, yeah. But then when you have these kids who have been like sitting with their rock and getting to know it, um, it was like a really interesting, like ethical question for myself. Yeah. Of, what do yeah. we do here? And so what I, what I decided on is I invited the students to um, tell a secret to their rock mm -hmm. and then to leave their rock in the place. And so the place would hold their secret and they could come back and visit the place which knew their very secret. Cool. Um, that's very cool. Yeah, that's but cool. I didn't have to deal with the like, <laughs> yeah. yes, you're allowed to take the coolest rocks off of the preserve yeah. question. Um, but it, it felt very meditative, like as they were sitting there with this object. Cause like a leaf, if you try to like hug it with your hand is gonna turn into a bunch of little dead leaf bits. But a rock, you can like have this really physical experience of having it in your hand. And I think that might have been what felt um, so connected to them in yeah. a way that the leaves don't. And so I love this idea of connecting some of these qualities and the practice of dwelling in some of these kind of intangibles um, mm -hmm. as a way to incorporate that more deliberately. Mm -hmm. And it's something you can do in a classroom too, yeah. if you wanted to, you wouldn't, or yeah. maybe if it rained so badly, you couldn't go out, you could right. use it, you know, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. So also, I was wondering um, if you had a way to follow up later on with the classroom through the teacher, or through the uh, another visit, it's such an incredible experience, you know, you just I would be wanting it to go on and on. Yes. Yeah. The one and done is like, it's really hard. And so um, I make an effort to have, if I work with a kid um, at all during a school year, I make every effort to work with that same class more than once. Um, oh, and cute. so it often looks like I'll do a classroom visit in the fall, followed pretty closely by a fall field visit, and then a, a, also a spring field visit. I'm still working on getting teachers comfortable with the winter field visit thing. I've got a few teachers who have bought in, which is really great. Um, but yeah, the like one and then you're gone forever thing feels like we're losing out on a lot of yeah. really incredible learning. And I think even just two field visits makes a huge impact, um, both so. because they're like building relationship with me, they're building relationship with the journaling skill. They're also building that deeper relationship with place, getting to see how it changes over time. They get to look back in their journal and see what's the same and what's different. And that's really special. But that was something when we were developing this program, I felt was pretty important to prioritize rather than like cranking through as many individual kids as we possibly could. How do we make it more meaningful for the mm -hmm. kids that are closest to the places that we're taking them to? Yeah. Um, and then and, yeah. hopefully it'll continue in their lives, right. you know, so. That's okay. the hope is that like they will time. pick, yeah, they will pick it up and, and uh, run with it in ways that I can't possibly envision or right. you know, exactly. expect. Yeah, well, absolutely. Congratulations again. Thank it's you wonderful. so much. Thank you. Are the, the, some really, really wonderful thoughts there. Um, so that that's, that's why then you, have the metric of the student, student days. days instead yeah. of number of students reached. That's exactly right. Yeah. So if we change the metric by which we measure things, we're able to not have something like a, you know, some test that gets you focused on the wrong thing. Right. You're that's that's really, really wise. I love your idea of the walking meditation. Yeah. 
Um, it makes me, so you've got, so Tara's experience, they're walking, they're journaling, they're walking, they're journaling. There's these walking periods and those um, part of that can be, you know, going over the stream, the adventure of walking, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. to have, you know, students be concentrating on the adventure. We're going down this adventure gulch and um, let's, let's see what we, uh, you know, experience. Like, how are we navigate this, 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 this crossing or whatever it is. Another way to kind of handle the transit things um, in the, mm -hmm. the Beatles, are you familiar with the Beatles program? Yeah, so the, what is it? It's an acronym for, it's a Lawrence Hall of Science Environmental Education Resource better education better environmental education teaching learning, learning. strategy and it ends it's, yes. it's a tortured acronym that ends up being beetles right <laughs> um but they have this really cool activity where they have um you pair students up you give them a question and as they're walking down the trail they're discussing it so these discussions mm -hmm. so that before when we did environmental education programs there'd be sort of these sort of talking moments and then the walking moments this mm -hmm. allowed people to do the talk and walk um and then uh star you're suggesting this other additional way we can sort of play with some of the transit times is to give the structure for a walking meditation and um, then we're cultivating a different thing in each one of each one of those walking sections can be a very, very different experience. Yeah, it's good to to um, designate a specific space, you know, to do it. And it's good to do it in silence. So, yeah, otherwise they're someplace else. But, yeah, I think it's really powerful and it's really helpful to help kids settle in. Good luck. Thank you so much. I am very excited to bring some of this into my program. So thank you so much for these You're suggestions. Welcome. Star, sure. so wise. Thank you. Um, let's bring in the mad botanist on this conversation as well. <laughs> okay, trying again. Here we sure. go. Hey there. Um, yeah, I've, I've got like four pages of notes now because you are super inspiring and I'm excited to try. Oh, and look at Jack's, look at Jack's, it's yeah. awesome. It, it, this, is, this, is, this has been a, a really, 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 really rich time. So um, yeah, you might uh, get folks contracting you to come out to their-, their, their I would be department. so delighted. Here, I'll put my email address in the chat. Great, and let's let's also include that in the event description when we post mm -hmm. this online. Okay, no Would problem. you be comfortable with that? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Great. Um, so I had a question for you about, um, I, I, I heard you earlier mention that you go sometimes to school campuses to do activities with them. Um, are those, um, in themselves like standalone things or are they part of um visiting like do you do you visit classrooms in advance before the field trip to work with them within class as well or great question yeah so most of the time when i'm doing campus visits it's about an hour-long visit that's like within a week of their first field trip with me of the school year and in that hour i do a little like guided discussion so think pair share about why like what is land conservation and why should we care about land um, we do a similar think pair share about, you know, I'll describe the day. I'll tell them what the weather forecast is. I'll say, we'll be walking for this far. We'll be sitting, we'll be whatever. Um, what should we bring or wear so that we can stay safe and comfortable all day. So they have a little bit of prep and thinking about like, don't wear your brand new bright white tennis shoes. Cause they're not going to be white by the end of your field trip. Right. Or just like giving them a little bit of a heads up you know, kind of what my expectations are. Like, yes, my child, you do need to bring a backpack. I don't want you carrying all of your things in your arms all day, for example. Um, and then I do a little intro to nature journaling. And we, I do, um, you know, I talk about metadata. We practice words, pictures, and numbers in the context of metadata. Um, and then I have them journal about their own hand. And I just do a super basic, 
words, pictures, numbers, notice, wonder reminds me of about your own hand. And if I have time, if we're moving quickly, I'll also sometimes do a zoom in bubble um, practice. I'll like hand out hand lenses mm -hmm. and they can practice doing a little zoom in. But basically it's just to get them familiar with that language um, and that thinking routine so that when they get off the bus, it's one less level of overwhelm um, <laughs> because it's a lot, it's a lot. Uh, so that's kind of the standard offering ahead of field trips. And I do that for almost every single class that I work with. Um, they'll have that pre visit in the fall. Um, and then some schools also, I will go in and do like an hour of journaling just out on campus with them. Um, and sometimes it's because the teachers just want to get their kids outside. Sometimes it's because I came and did a field trip with them in the fall, but they haven't journaled since then and they want their kids to have a little refresher or whatever. So there's a lot of space for flexibility there, but the the main uh, the main offering that's related to our field trip program most directly is that one hour kind of structure version. That's awesome. I like that it, that, that way you're getting them prepared for what to expect. And yeah. especially like what you mentioned about the white tennis shoes. I know it sounds silly to us who like to go outside and, and be in the mud, but for some kids, like those white tennis shoes either cost a bunch or they meet are meaningful to them. So right. giving them that information in advance can be super important for making the kids feel better sense of belonging, I find. Um, yeah. So. And then I'm not like getting on their case about why don't you want to walk down the trail and and they're having to then tell me that they love their shoes too much to go for a hike. And it's like, okay, well, I can preempt a lot of these kinds of like, I don't even want to call them conflicts, but this kind of like cultural expectation mismatch by just letting them know exactly what's going to be happening ahead of time. Definitely. And the, 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 the clean shoes things also has a real, there's so the, the kind of a, a, a framing on that that helped me kind of understand it much better is that if you come from a environment where everybody's running around in the woods you've got a relationship with dirt that is based on your understanding of what dirt is think about dirt in the city in a dense urban environment dirt is a really different beastie mm -hmm. and if you are living in a way so that you keep your shoes clean, you are also living in a way that helps you, um, is, is avoiding disease and real dangerous things that is in urban dirt. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's a survival mechanism on top of everything else. And for the longest time, like when, when I was starting off in outdoor ed, kids would show up and they would want to have their, you know, their shoes clean. I know I even know naturalists who thought it was funny to like scuff some dirt on a kid's shoes. Um, people were just not getting that like this is there, there's several things. One, there's 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 um it those shoes may uh you know, have 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 a significant to the significance to the kids that you don't get and you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Um the economic cost that it took to get those shoes was really a big deal, perhaps for that student. And they're also protecting themselves from um, from uh, really dangerous conditions. If you're keeping your shoes clean, you're actually less exposed to dangerous urban muck. So um, yeah, having clothes that you can be outside in and are com can be comfortable inside of, makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. And so. I'll say too that the, so I buy, I've bought like a bulk roll of yoga mat. Like you can get a yoga mat that's like this big around, like the roll is this big around. Um, and I cut it up into little sitting mats because a lot of kids don't want their pants to get dirty for all the same yeah. reasons, right? And kids who are like, I'm absolutely not sitting on the ground. Okay, so we're gonna sit on a yoga mat. Problem solved. Right. Like, yeah, you know, and it's like, it's great for keeping the pants from getting so dirty, but also like if it's muddy, if it's wet, if it's cold, it's such an easy thing to just like throw in the backpack or like they'll stick it under the straps of their pack, carry it with them all day. Um, and it was like a game changer. And if you get yoga mats, you can just like hose them off when they get too disgusting. 
Do you mind if and I good ask... for ticks? Yeah. Do you mind if I ask another question about like gear and that kind of thing? Sure. Um, what sorts of of like clothing um, or gear things do you provide if kids need it, and how do you coordinate that? Yeah, so that's something that we're definitely still working on. I, my cubicle in the office is full of like thirty pairs of rain boots. <laughs> Like everyone knows my cube as the boot cube. Um, in fact, I just went into the office the other day and there was a new pair of boots on my desk. I don't know where they came from, but they're mine now. They're, they're, they're um, breeding. They're starting to reproduce. Yeah, except somehow they turned bright red. So I have this like cherry the, red the pair of green boots. Are, are often, uh, but often as they pick. age, they their colors darken. That's, that's right. They, they, yeah. they, mellow, they get their adult <laughs> plumage and they right. turn into those black boots. Boring. So I have, I have like plenty of... Um, rubber boots. I have ponchos, which I don't love because they're like kind of flimsy. So we're in early stages of either doing like a community wide coat drive or just getting grant funding to buy a couple class sets of coats. But with that one, it's a little tricky because I don't want all of the kids who are in conservancy coats to be wearing the exact same coat. Um, so that they're not like visibly tagged as kids who don't have a coat. And so it would like, if I'm buying them, I'm going to be pretty careful to get like a collection of colors, a couple different brands. And, you know, they might, we'll tag them like inside the collar, but I, I don't want the, any of the kids to feel like, oh, I, everybody knows that I don't have a coat. Um, but I have rain ponchos for the days where it's just like gross out. <laughs> Um, like where it's pretty grim and then I have gloves just like you know pretty basic cotton gloves we don't ever get like super cold here you know um I don't have to deal at this at this place I don't have to deal with the like oh you're not dressed appropriately and so it's literally dangerous it's just a like discomfort thing. And so I think the calculus is a little bit different. Like I used to work in Minnesota and we had a very serious gear closet for kids to borrow from because there it's like, if you go outside dressed inappropriately, like you could just die. <laughs> um, you could just die because it's 30 degrees below. Um, and so uh, it's a little different here. Um, but yeah, this is something that we're still like working on and the coordination ahead of time, there isn't really a way. And so I just have to bring everything on days when I think we might need it. And so I'm actually lobbying the conservancy leadership to get me a van that will be our education van. And the back would have like pull out racks of coats and boots so that I could just pull up to whatever field trip site I'm working at, open yep. the back of the van, kids could come by, grab a coat if they need it. And then they just put it back at the end of the day. Because right now, like it, it's a little bit of a mess, honestly, dealing with like totes of boots in a car and then like the unfolded ponchos, you know, it's, it's not great. The logistics are not ideal. <laughs> this is really smart. This is really, really deep. You're taking care of people in a, in a, in such a attentive, loving and human way. And then giving them exposure to nature and the natural world. Um, we need more of this. Yeah. Like, I, was... I didn't realize how lucky I was that this was just part of my life growing up until I started working with kids who, like, I still remember the first time I worked with kids. I was living in the Bay Area, working up near Tahoe. I got some kids up there from East Palo Alto who we got them on a boat on a lake where you could see all of the sides of the lake at the same time. And they said, I've never been on the ocean before. It was like, you live very close to the ocean. Yeah. And they couldn't differentiate between the ocean and the Alpine Lake because they just hadn't, it wasn't that they were dumb. It was just that they hadn't had any exposure. I was like, oh, I had something growing up that these kids just didn't have. And be, ever since then, I've been like, okay, I need to be pretty self-aware about <laughs> what I expect as nor like what I got to experience as a normal childhood and a normal like upbringing with regard to nature access. Um, and so it feels really important to make sure that I'm attending to that 
recognizing when it's tripping me up, recognizing when it's making it so that I'm having a hard time building a relationship with kids, with communities, um, and, and acting accordingly. I think that that is, for me, that's one of the most moving things I've heard an educator say about trying to increase accessibility. And I wish that there, like, like what, what Jack and others have been saying, I wish that there were more people like you who really are that conscientious. Um, Cause when you talk about those kids who go out, like, you know, who go out onto the lake and, and say that they have never been on the ocean before, it makes me think of a lot of kids um, that I grew up with here in, in San Francisco and have worked with before. And I remember one time we all went on a snow trip at my work. And of course it had been the first time a lot of people had seen snow. Um, and so hearing about you, like really noticing the things that other people haven't had and taking the time and the effort and the considerable effort to create better equity for each of them is incredibly moving. And I, seri and I seriously wish that more people were like you, Sarah. Thank, thank you. you <laughs> thank you for doing that for those kids. Oh gosh, it is my, it's like the honor of my lifetime to get to do this. Yeah. I don't know how I got so lucky. And, and it's it's on our, our honor to have you um, on our, our our show today. We're going to be wrapping up in just a moment. Um, before we do, is there any um, last uh, thing you wanted to share with the group, or um, and also if if people wanted to get uh, in touch with you, follow the work that you're doing, or learn more about um, stewardship in Southern Oregon, where might they go? What great questions. Yeah, so um, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy's website is landconserve.org. I'll put it in the chat. Um, we have a newsletter if you want to see pictures of cool things like fairy shrimp and kids in oak trees. <laughs> um, if anyone wants, we recently uh, had a line of t-shirts and stickers printed that say we protect fairies. Um, and it has fairy poppies and fairy shrimp, which are two of our endangered species in this area. So if you want to buy a t-shirt, you can email me. Or if you want a sticker, send me your mailing address and I'll just send you a sticker that says we protect fairies. Um, but yeah, please check us out. We're, we just recently got a new social media amazing expert on our team. So we're more active on the socials these days. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know what our handles are, but I know that we're on Instagram. <laughs> um, and Facebook. It's something, yeah, something or other. Yeah, so it's a it's in there somewhere. Um, definitely email would be great. Feel free anytime to reach out if you want to talk about journaling. In case you couldn't tell, I like really love nature journaling. <laughs> um, and so I'm always excited to talk about it and like tell everyone about how great it is and help. Um, I do also do professional development workshops in collaboration with the Oregon Natural Resources Education Program, ONREP which is another branch of OSU Extension. Um, and those are offered free of charge to educators in Oregon, but we also sometimes have online ones. And they just asked if I could do a nature journaling one online sometime next school year. Um, so if you drop me a line, I can also like send you info about those. And if you wanna come for an in-person one, if you're close by, that's cool. Or you can get updates when there's um, online ones happening. Um, and those are, yeah, really great. Uh, you can get your PDUs, you can get your, some of them even offer like substitute reimbursement. Um, so that's like pretty cool program. Um, and let's see. Oh, there's one, there's one thing that at the very beginning of our call today, this flagged up for me, um, our stewardship director, when we had a, um, we had like a little staff retreat a while ago to do some strategic planning and some visioning. And we were talking about, we did essentially a think pair share about um, like why the work feels important to each of us. And she said that, you know, it can be really hard, um, especially in the face of climate change, our landscapes are changing faster than we can tend to them. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if the species that we thought were supposed to live here are going to live here anymore. You know, it's this like huge whirlwind of confusion. Sometimes it can feel really hopeless. Sometimes it can feel like, why bother? Um, and she said that the effort of caring 
is transformational. Just the effort of caring. Um, it's true, we might not be able to save every habitat. It's true that our landscapes might change really radically. It's true that climate change might have impacts beyond anything we can possibly imagine. And still the effort of caring, the effort of showing up, the effort of trying, just the effort, not even necessarily the outcome, but the effort of trying, the effort of caring is transformational. And so I wanted to leave you with that at the end of our call. Thank you. And with that, folks, we're going to close for today. Um, deep gratitude to you, uh, uh, Tara, for uh, what you were doing for your community and for all of us. I also want to thank my co-host, Avea Moore, for your help in taking care and nurturing this online community here. Um, we look forward to being in conversation with all of you again. And um, this is, it's, it's all a work in progress. And just imagine having this conversation a decade from now. Um, we'll have even more tricks up our sleeves. We want to invite everybody to, to join us in exploring kind of the best practices and how we can do this, how we can share this beautiful natural world with each other and inspire and support each other in protecting and preserving um, this world for all of us and all the other species that uh, here and dwell. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you all.